Hello, everyone, and welcome to the next and first PISA for You Network webinar of 2019. 2018 flew by, and here we are, starting off the new year all together once again. And with us today for our webinar is Ken Silborn of Australia, and I will pass it to you, Ken, to do your introduction as well. There will be a four minute video after um, Ken has done his introduction that we are all very much looking forward to. Ken? Terrific. Uh, thanks for that, Jennifer. It's um, it's nice to be here and actually nice to be doing this at a, a civilised time. It's um, seven o'clock in the, the evening over in Australia. So um, so it's quite nice. Mind you, it's a it's a bit warm. We've had a, quite a few warm days at the moment. But look, I'll just show you this video clip that, um, that was actually made by the Varki Foundation. And um, they spent quite a lot of money on it. So I feel like I'm sort of obliged that I've I have to follow it, but the um, it, it also is a good link for what I'll be talking about during the webinar. Fantastic, thanks. Man. I'm Ken Silburn, and I'm the head teacher of science at Kashula High School which is a school in New South Wales, Australia. Good morning. <laughs> what we want students to be able to do is to take control of their, their learning and to be inspired and engaged in what they do. Set. Go. Not a normal classroom teacher. He's very spontaneous. He's very enthusiastic when he comes to class. He doesn't just teach it, he preaches it. The way he explains stuff, he also tells stories a lot. And once he's got them hooked, then he brings out his air rockets and his, you know, experiments with this and that. That type of learning, you know, 21st century learning, problem solving, that is a, in, in a conventional sort of classroom setting is not just really exciting for the kids, it's really exciting for the teacher. If you just read from a book, maybe some of that information gets into your head. But if you actually get your hands into the subject and do it, then, then you learn because Mr. Silburn is doing science. A lot more people are choosing science. It's really motivating to see that a teacher has so much passion for his students. Our cows move softly. They which really I think I'm lucky because people, when they get to my age, they, they tend to have hobbies. Well, I get paid to do my hobby. For me, teaching isn't nine to five. It's after school, weekends, working with other teachers. I wouldn't say I'm a, a geek. I, I love technology. Um, and I, I like to use it in the classroom and I like to use it myself. Ken is a great teacher because he just doesn't stop. It's quite common to get emails from Ken between two and four in the morning. If I'm tired, I sleep. If I'm awake, just get up and I'll do work. Good morning. Our region, southwest of Sydney, it's just been behind the eight ball when it comes to education. We often get kids who, who don't believe that they can um, achieve as if they think, no, I can't do it, it's too hard, then then it is too hard. But if they have this belief that they can do it, even if they have a, a problem as they go through, oh. then they will solve that problem and they'll have success. A lot of the teachers that teach here grew up in the area in South West Sydney, so we intimately understand the challenges that the kids go through. My family actually didn't have that much money. Ken's just like one of these kids. He smashed a glass ceiling many years ago. I was the first and only person in my family to go to university because I had teachers that had faith in me. It's obvious that good teaching changes lives. Six years ago, we created a program called iSTEM. So STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, that open up opportunities for students regardless of their school. And that's actually developed now into basically a multinational project. We had a, a student at Space Camp a few years ago, Daniel, who was confronted with a fictitious problem that was given to him. One of his, his crew members on the, the spacecraft had had a heart attack and, and he came up just immediately with this, this ingenious idea of let's use the aluminium foil we've got, these wires, these batteries, let's make our own defibrillator. And Daniel actually received a, an award called The Right Stuff. Everything of my life was changed from that point. I wanted to be able to fly amongst the stars. We're actually able to show them that 
you can aspire to do anything that you want to. It makes the horizon open up. The number of students that he would have helped in Australia would be thousands, but internationally, I know that there are way beyond the thousands. Ken has been able to take what we do at Kashula High, what we all passionately believe in, and take it to other children around the world. It doesn't matter where a kid is in the world, the kid's a kid. and. The, the same experiments and activities I do with, with my students. When I was in India, I was able to do that too. My generation won't be able to solve the problems that we're having in the world with, with climate change. But our next generation will. And it's really important that we actually give them the skills and the belief that they can solve those problems. So I have a belief that it doesn't matter where you are in the world, it doesn't matter about how much money you have, you should have the same opportunity that students at my school have. That was great. Now I think we'll have to wait a sec for Ken to come back to us. Terrific. Now, if I, isn't this with the technology, if I just click here. Oh, I'm Ken Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I think I just have to go. Ah, uh, there we go. It's one of those funny things when you're sharing the screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, back again. Um, look, can I just say thank you for the invite to to present today? The um, what I will talk about probably elaborates a lot on that video, and um, it is one of those the things that I should point out that to do things like this, it's not just one person; it's a team and. Well, I've just been so lucky to be involved in a terrific teams and with um, some terrific teachers and and also some terrific students. But um, that was at um, Kishula High School and I'm now at Bowell High School, which is quite pleasant. It's only nine minutes drive away from, from home and um, it gives me quite a lot more time to, to do the other things that I'd like to do, in, including walking the dog of the morning. So it's quite good fun. But um, look, I'll, I'll just kick off. I'll be sharing my my desktop and going backwards and forwards, and um, we'll see how that works. That works. Quick question for you. Have you always taught high school? Yes, um, always high school. And um, high school's been... Uh, I actually started my career or my, my science career doing biochemistry for a pathology company and had the, the opportunity to retrain as a teacher and I thought, yep, that sounds that sounds good. So okay. um so that's where I, I popped into. So um, I'm going to um, show you a screen, but I've Whenever I show people this, I always have to talk first about um, about water being um, H2O, so um, hydrogen or dihydrogen monoxide. So um, in the screen, I'll let you read it. Actually, I might read it for you as well. Ken has been a science teacher for 25 years. He has easy access to chemicals. For the past nine years, he's been adding dihydrogen monoxide to his morning coffee. Ken is now addicted. Without DHMO, he will die in three days. He continues to teach. And when I do a presentation where I talk about dihydrogen monoxide, you know, I always have to say that it is water because otherwise people will think, you know, this poor person is addicted to this drug. Um, however, um, the, and, and some people will be really nice. I'll think, you know, it's, it's, it's really awful that he's addicted. But others will be thinking, you know, why is he actually in the classroom? And uh, it really pinpoints why we need to have students that are science it, or they're illiterate in science. Okay, my, my goal over the, the years has really been to talk about engaging students and... Um, I'm just going to try and flip back here so I can get on to. We see you. Yep, good. Okay. Um, one of the things I've 
when I first started teaching, there was this big buzzword, which was to engage students. And, um, and that really meant if you had students in your classroom and they enjoyed being there, then that was what you should be doing. However, after you know, 20 odd years of teaching, or now it's almost um, 30 years of teaching, I've, I've gone back to the real belief is that our role is, is as educators. So our job is to educate students. So you know, students need to be able to read, write, and, 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 and do the, the, the mathematics behind things. Um, and we should engage students. But hopefully as we go through that, then we'll actually inspire students um, to actually want to be at school and want to learn and then go on and, um, and go on to what they're passionate about. So um, that's just my, my little bit of a, of a change. Now, one of the, the things which when I, I talk about I mean, where I'm from, I'll just give you a bit of a geography lesson. So uh, I'm from Australia, that's this big continent down here. And um, I actually live in the state of New South Wales. If you're um, showing the map, we can't see it. Oh, okay. So you can see me? Yeah. Oh, okay, so i go back to screen share again, there we go. Now we see it. Okay. So there's Australia, and um, I, I live in New South Wales, um, quite sort of um, halfway between Sydney and the Australian Capital Territory. Now, most people, when they talk about Australia, they, they talk about Sydney, so, um, you know, the Sydney Opera House and the, the Sydney Harbour Bridge, which are all really nice places. Um, one thing which is amazing is just even though Australia is so big, we are connected and connected to the world. So there's no reason why a student from my class could not talk to anybody from another class in another country. Um, as long as there's you know, no problems with the time delay, um, that technology is available. And my whole focus um, when I talk about science, well, my big focus is on science by doing. So. Um, and if I just introduce two of my grandchildren, I've actually got four. That um, this is William and Austin. Um, photo was taken a few days ago, but I'll, I'll talk about their their learning probably a little bit later on um, as we go through. So um, with iSTEM, um, iSTEM. Um, in the video clip, it said about STEM being science, technology, engineering, and maths. But the one thing about, if I go back to here so I can see people. There we go. Um, when we started the, the iSTEM program, it really came up um, because we wanted a way of, of, of working with students. And we had been developing a program for, for students to go to the, the US. And that was to actually participate in the, the Space Camp or the, the Space Academy program over in Huntsville. Now, that program was, was amazing. Um, our first year, we had over 240 students that actually placed in expressions of interest. Wow. To, to, to go on the program. And, um, the one thing was which, um, in, I mean, it was costly. You know, it was, wasn't at all cheap. So, so we ended up taking, I think it was 45 or 47 students. But the, we actually realised that we had all these students that just wanted to be involved in science. So, so we had the, you know, the students that did all the, the space stuff and, um, and all the astronaut type training. And then we thought, why not open this up to lots of other students? Because we had lots of different organisations that came on board that recognised that we had students that wanted to learn about science. So that was their good opportunity. Um, so we had, we had people like um, uh, Chris McKay from NASA Ames um, volunteering his time. 
And when you consider you know, his, his speciality in, in working with space and just the, you know, freely giving up his time, that was absolutely amazing. So we had some really good ties with NASA and every time anybody from, from NASA came out to Australia, um, they were very keen to talk to our students. And these were students from lots of different schools. So we decided let's open it up to any student. So we started running workshops for, for students on weekends and holidays um, with any school. The only criteria was they just had to be interested in, in, in science. They look very interested in that photo. <laughs> oh, look, um, the, the, the kids just absolutely loved it. And one of the things about science, um, and I'm not wanting to, to label some kids as being dorky or, or anything like that, but but if a student goes, say, say if a boy goes to school on a Monday morning, after watching the football on the weekend, they, they can have a conversation with their friends about football. Um, but if they're interested in science, they couldn't. They, there just wasn't the body of students for them to be able to talk about what they enjoyed. And the good thing about iSTEM is that actually it allowed students and their families to be involved. So, um, so that was always quite good. And um, I sh should have mentioned about why we had the I in front of iSTEM. It was just because we thought that anything that was exciting for students had to have an I in front of it, like iPads and iPods. And um, so we ended up having a, a lot of personalities. Like this was the um, education, the federal education minister that we were at a ABC um, show, and he actually came to us to get his photo taken with us. So we thought that was quite cool. The Those are some proud looking students. Ah, look, um, the, the students just um, absolutely loved it. And it was really good because we could actually um, tell students that they were actually enjoying what, or that they were good at what they were doing. Um, so then we started promoting competitions for students to be involved in. And um, my school was a focus because I had a lot of students I could see every day, but still it was actually open to students from any school. So um, in the, the next slides here, I'll move across. Why and when, sorry to, can I ask you a quick question? Yep, yep please do. So why and when did STEM become such a buzzword in education? Like it seems like it popped up out of nowhere. Uh, STEM, um, I, I actually think it just came up as, you know, if we talk about um, key learning areas, so if I talk about the creative arts, then you know, I'm talking about music, I'm talking about drama, I'm talking about um, uh, you know, just performing. and when they tried to, to put the idea of, of mathematics and science together and, and also engineering, um, they came up with STEM. And there's, there's actually been quite a few different variations. There's um, sometimes people will, will call it STEAM. They'll put an A in there um, to do with the art. And, and realistically, um, when you see a lot of the things that our students have, have completed, you cannot do those without being creative and without the artistic flair. And um, so that's that's one of the, the things that, that pops up. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so we actually got involved in lots of competitions. Um, this was a, as a result of a, a video competition. These students, um, and you recognize them in some other photos, but um, the prize was we had these bikes that would connect up to the computer and we could analyze um, different speeds and and different loads and and um, quite an amazing thing but just that the technology that the students used was quite simple and and quite effective um, the other thing too is we started to get involved in whatever we could that that was of no cost so um, things like helping the environment 
um, a lot of organisations would would come to the party and and they would supply the bus or they would supply um, the the plants that we needed. So that there wasn't we weren't asking for money. And I think that was the the big thing. So um, without um, science by doing, um, if I just jump back. The, um, when we, we talk about science by doing, it's amazing if you can get students, I mean, teaching is all about telling stories. And if you can actually get students to actually develop their own stories, and that really helps with their learning and with their engagement. Um, have you noticed any um, like stereotypes around STEM or any, let's say, kind of a secondary question, but any criticism towards it? Uh, look, uh, there are some people I think that because it's a buzzword, um, some people, especially you know, principals, uh, have got on this idea that STEM is um, is basically looking at coding. Um, and that's, that's because there's been a lot of funding available um, through coding. Um, but it's it's more than that. It's really looking at you know, it's science, it's technology, um, engineering, and mathematics, and trying to get those um, actually combined, rather than being taught as as separate entities. Have you personally experienced any barriers when trying to implement STEM in either of the high schools that you worked at? Yes. Um, the the one thing that I'll just jump back so we can see. It. The, the one thing I found when we talk about STEM um, in a lot of schools, um, they still actually treat um, the idea of teaching it separately. And um, so the idea of STEM is to really get students involved in looking at combining science, technology, engineering and mathematics at the same time, rather than looking at little small bits. Um, but schools are, are very slow to change, but they are changing. So how does one implement, um, I mean, I went to elementary school or high school a little while ago at this point, but I had math class, I had science class, I didn't have an engineering class. So how in math class is the science also being pulled in in a way that's not redundant in the science class? Um, I, I think it's the idea is that what you've got to do is have, is have a team of, of people that can sit down and look at the curriculum and work out what you can do that can tie those in. Okay. And yeah, so that's that's the best way to, to do it. Um, the problem I do see in some schools is that you do get a team and you get some people that are up and running very, very well. And then maybe one of those key players in that team moves to another school um, because they're doing really good stuff. And then you've got to actually try and fill up that hole, you know, and, and try and make things work. How, um, this might be a bit tricky to, to answer, so let's say you have one teacher, two teachers who is incredibly interested in incorporating more STEM into their, um, into their classrooms overall, not everyone is on board, what kind of angles would you take to kind of sway them to understanding or be more interested in implementing STEM? Yep, well, what I've seen at the, the school I'm at now um, is they actually have um, the mathematics curriculum, they've got science curriculum, and they also have a specialist STEM class, or actually two specialist STEM classes. So they will do you know, basically project work. So students will have a project that will be a, a long-term project, you know, not just a 40 minutes or 50 minutes to do in a, in a class. And then they will design and, and run through that design process of actually building something which they can use. So that might be investigating or designing a house that, that needs to be energy efficient. It could be looking at um, making up a, a robot that's a robot arm that can, in fact, the, um, the teacher, head teacher at my school at the moment, his class has, has been designing a robot that can actually cook eggs and bacon. <laughs> so so that just, you know, trying to get a, a robot that can actually have an arm that can that can actually turn things over. Um, quite complex, but 
um, it's amazing when students work together, they can they can solve it. Um, and so do you think that these kinds of activities and other teachers who are maybe not as interested in STEM at the beginning or are apprehensive about it, that they see that it's exciting students and engaging students and then they kind of get like the itch to jump on the train? Like, is that the type of? Yeah, well, look, the, the one thing that good teachers do is um, teachers like to, to share their knowledge, but also the, the good teachers, the teacher can step back and go, oh, look, I'm not quite sure, or to say, hey, look, I saw this, but I don't know how it works, or um, I saw this idea and I thought, let's have a go at, at making this. And um, I'll, I'll show you an example later on about how um, my idea as a teacher is to a project I wanted to, to work with actually didn't work. Um, the students weren't at all interested in it, but they actually decided on, on something which was much better. Okay. Okay, well, I will hand it back to you and stop asking any questions. Okay. No, please, please ask all the time. Otherwise, it's, um, <laughs> yeah, it's just a case of me talking and it's, it might get a little bit boring. So here we go. Um, I go back. So the, the focus there was I was talking about science by doing and um, the, the one thing I found with, with technology is um, if I can take as many photos as possible then um, of students doing work and enjoying work and get people to see those photos and that's really good. Um, sometimes though, if you do give a, a student a camera they decide they've got to take selfies and um, and it doesn't look too good. But um, one of, one of the, the good things I, I did with my year nine class um, started two years ago. Um, actually, for a few years, I was running, just making um, a mock disasters or mock, um, uh, I just lost my words here. Um, making up a, a forensic science case and getting students to actually solve it. Solve it. And um, it ended up being quite a lot of work, but then I stumbled on an idea of, of making up the crime scene and then giving the students the cameras and getting them to make up what they thought was the scenario. And, um, and if I just go back, because this is one good... Um, if you just Google forensics.rice.edu, an awesome website for um, for students on on forensic science. So, um, yeah, so students can work through that, and at the same time, you can get students to be involved in making up their their own crime scenes. The um, the other thing is to get involved in using the technology that students would use when they left, when they do leave school. So um, instead of just do, using uh, lights and doing circuits, then what we do is we use Arduino you know, um, and do some programming. Now, I did say that I was, i just go back here. The, um, we had some students, actually my, my physics class were invited quite a few years ago to to do some um, workshops just to trial them on coding at the Sydney Powerhouse Museum. So we went in and the, the students got involved in the, in the coding. And I had this idea that you could actually have a curtain that is, would be near a window and remote controlled so that whenever anybody walked past, the curtain would follow them. And I thought that would be really good fun. But our um, the students actually came up with some other ideas and we ended up making a Sedgeway. And um, it was really good because the, the Sedgeway um, worked and it was a massive team effort. So um, we had bits and pieces that were brought in from, from students and we, we spent um, weekends and after school going through the coding and it worked. Um, you stand on it, you go, lean forward, you go forward, lean back, you go back. That is and, so cool. 
and we had a, a toggle switch so they could go left and right and even a, a button on the the handle there was a as a dead man handle so if you did fall off it wouldn't just keep on running down the street so um that was that was absolutely amazing uh, it's it still blows me away that you know the students were spent so much time and and just loved doing it the um the other thing we end up doing was doing things in a big way so when my children um, were grown up out of their swing set um, that that was donated to school and we actually made a, a trebuchet that could fire a um, what well, shot put ball so it could actually fire you know, as if you're firing cannonballs um, quite a large distance but you know, it's you know, really big and it was a big project that students got involved in the um, the other thing is um, to use technology that students are actually used to using so um, you'll see these girls are using an iPad and one is wearing is, is using a um, lux meter now the lux meter is quite an expensive piece of equipment however you can now download software that will convert your your iPhone or, or any phone into a lux meter and um, at no cost so we so we actually had all of year seven went around to every room in the school and we did an audit on the lights so we had an idea as to um, how much light you needed in the classroom whether you how much light was there when the light was on when the lights were off and with the blinds up or the blinds down and it really made students focus on the fact that we are wasting a lot of of electricity um, purely by having lights on when they're not needed the um the other thing too about using technology is to to get students to work in teams and i think that works especially when you've got um, not enough equipment for every student to do it so teams have to have a, a variety of tasks um, and if you get them to work as as researchers and write up grant proposals then um, then they're involved the the other thing is that kids enjoy pulling things to pieces and and learning and um, i've got a habit of whenever i drive around and find old vacuum cleaners i sort of collect them and <laughs> eventually we um, we pull them to pieces but it's um it's amazing how students get involved in looking at the technology it's funny i'm seeing this picture of sorry my, my image is frozen but i think you can hear me right yes yep okay perfect um, all of my friends who were involved in engineering all had the common thread of enjoying taking things apart and putting them back together again. And I think it's really great that you're exposing your students to that in the classroom. I'm curious about how a vacuum cleaner works. And I think I would have been back then as well. And I think that that's a really interesting and very simple way to um, engage students in how things work. I think that's a very cool yeah. tactic. Yeah. Um, it's it's amazing when we just going to get us back here. There we go. Yeah, it's amazing when when students actually able to to pull things apart. Normally they don't get a chance to do that at home. And um, so yeah, when they they see how things work, and if you give them something which is broken, and try and fix it, then that's another step as well. But um, there's lots of um, activities, pardon me, that um, students can be involved in and, and organisations that, that will actually work with students, mm -hmm. um, especially now because when we talk about STEM, um, they want to be investing their money in students. So by looking at STEM, um, that really helps. Interesting. Um, yeah. Okay. So this is actually at the... Um, I always go to call it Harry Potter, but at the Ian Potter um, building down in Canberra. Mm -hmm. And um, what is great about these activities are they're, they're very low cost, and but they get students to work in teams, not just working as a group, working as a team. And then at the the end, once they've got, you know, they've solved their problem, then they're actually looking at um, presenting their 
their problem or their solution. You're giving us so many great ideas for things that are easy, not easy, but good and effective to have in the classroom. It's fantastic. Oh, look, um, it's these things um, kids just really enjoy. And, you know, especially if you if you give them a, a problem um, on, and, and get them to actually ask questions or say, um, one of the things I, I, I like, we, um, we have um, big whiteboards, well, I won't say big, but you just imagine very cheap, but, but quite large whiteboards. And we give those to students as, as teams and they, they actually present and draw up what they've done and they go through their design process and say, this is what we did, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. and, and it can work with, with physics or math, mathematics if you're looking at um, problem solving. And we call this board meetings um, because we've got the whiteboards. <laughs> and, but the students actually um, know that the way that they ask questions, have to, um, the questions have to be in a positive tone. So um, it's always a case of, look, I like what, how you did this. Can you tell us why Why did you go into that step? Why didn't you do something else? And it's a, it's a big learning you know, experience for the students. Okay. That's super interesting. Um, I'm noticing the time right now. How do you think we're doing on time? Ah, uh, look, I didn't even look. Let's let me just keep on. I should run very, very fast. Otherwise, we've been talking too long. Um, there, look up the the previous slide. There, you, you'll see. You know, students are involved in in learning and, and looking at you know how that that electric motor works. But my grandson William. Um, who's right into Thomas the Tank. Um, over Christmas, he was given this toy, which is for fishing. And he was just so happy that actually he, he learned himself that he could actually connect up to the batteries on Thomas the Tank. And, um, and I, I sort of wonder if, you know, he's only two and a half years old, but does the way which we actually learn change? Um, this is um, one of our projects we had of students making water rockets, and eventually, um, uh, we had students who actually were involved as, as mentors for other students at our school, and we had a team that was with Australia, um, representing Australia over in Vietnam. In Vietnam. Yes, um, for the um, it was the Asia Pacific Water Rocket Challenge. So cool. So, so that was. That was absolutely awesome. Now, um, if people ask me about what the two great things that I that I do, or that you know teachers I know that are really different, um, one is this poster. Now, I spoke to you be, before when we we're off camera about um, this is a poster that I have just on the side of the door. So when students leave, um, they actually click it and or just give it a high five. And it's reassuring to the teacher because you straight away know that, well, students actually did learn something in the classroom because the students won't lie. And it reinforces to the students that, that they actually did learn something, that they weren't just you know, being entertained for five minutes. Mm -hmm. It's a moment of reflection for them. Yes, yes. Now, the, um, the next step, if um, just to remember about learning here, The um, one activity I do with, with students is to, to get them to, well, first of all, actually have one student who's, whose job is to actually stay awake in class. So that I get them to stand up and their job is to, to look around. And the rest of the students, I ask them to, to just close their eyes, relax, and I'll ask them two questions. So um, imagine this is, you know, if I'm asking you, to do this so you, your eyes are closed and i'm going to ask you two questions and let's say that the first question is what is your favorite food 
I'm going to do yeah. it. I'm going to close my eyes. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. So, okay, just relax. Now, I just want you to think about your favorite food. Okay, awesome. Open your eyes. Great. Okay, what was your favorite food? It's honestly spaghetti. Spaghetti? <laughs> okay. With um, what sauce? Anything? My, my dad's homemade sauce. Oh, okay. Now, I would guarantee that you did not see the word spaghetti, did you? No, I saw, I saw spaghetti. I saw like a bowl yeah. of spaghetti. Okay. And that is exactly the way that students learn. Um, it, you know, it could be 80%, but the majority of things that we learn, we actually stick in our head by what we see. And so it's, it's by what we see, by what we do, and, what, and, and how we smell. So when, you, when we get students to write down copious notes into their books, well, okay, they're, they're, they're seeing the word, but they're not actually seeing um, the picture. So if you can get students to actually be engaged and, and, and draw the pictures or you know, have that experience, then that's a way that things get into their head. So um, that's the way that I, I try and teach, with just being very mindful of that. That makes the, sense. Yep. The um, one thing too is you know, if we're looking at ways of trying to get students to remember things, um, the if I look at um, some terms that we need to know when we talk about science, so if we talk about variables, um, you know, independent, dependent, and constant variables, I, I don't know. If high school anxiety in me, <laughs> I'm trying to remember. <laughs> Well, look, for years I had um, a post inside my classroom because I always would um, forget which one was independent and which one was dependent. So this is the way which we teach it. For students in year seven, we talk about cows. And remember that our big aim is variables, independent, dependent, and constant. So, so we tell them in year seven that cows move softly. That's really stupid but it's stupid and students get into their head. Then we go on to the idea of, of variables and we say, well, in a scientific experiment, there's one thing you change, one thing you measure, and lots of things that you keep the same. Okay. So, so they've got that CMS there in their head. The next step, when they get to year nine and year 10, um, they're a little bit more aggro. Um, so we change it. So we actually say, I don't care. <laughs> and, and they remember that and then they go into the idea that, okay so it's independent dependent and constant okay and um so that's it okay look um I'm, I'm going to jump over to why we need to do stem um because that's that is probably the the overarching question as to you know why we're actually employed as teachers so why do we need students to learn stem and um the, the fact is that um, I, I like this because it's a the kid is a superhero, but um, there are so many things that we as adults have caused problems. Um, Australia's got um, a massive problem with, with droughts. Um, we've had over the last three days, actually um, yesterday, Australia was, I think, the top seven um, hottest places in the world were in Australia. and um, and since 2005, we've had um, the hottest years on record for the part or the top 10. So, you know, there's, there's definitely a problem there. Um, you know, Sorry. we're looking at... From the top 10, what, sorry, you cut out a little bit. Yeah, the, the actual, um, if you look at the, the temperature over the year, or um, the, the hottest 10 years, um, that we can remember have actually been in since 2005. Wow. So um, you know, anyone that doesn't believe in climate change or in global warming, um, I, I think there's enough evidence out there to, to say that, yep, it's definitely existing. Send them to Australia for a little while and they might change their tune. Yeah, well, um, uh, I mean, this this shot was over in India, um, just with floods and you've got to think, you know, the, the, the way that climate is changing so much, um, you know, things are, are just 
I mean, places used to get have floods, but they're now getting them more often, and and they're getting they're getting more frequent. I should more frequent, but they're getting worse. Um, but the other thing we've we've got to do is look at getting away from the idea of burning coal um, for our energy just because it's cheap. And so all the the new technology that we need to have, like wind power and solar power, we need our students to be able to to find those solutions. And in the end, we also need to be able to, to feed our planet. And the amount of people that are on the planet is just getting bigger and bigger. And um, and eventually, we're not just, we, there just won't be enough food. And what food we have is going to be really expensive. So um, these people I, I, I quite admire. Um, the, the top left there, that's Prime Minister um, Narendra Modi. Um, then under the hip, the President of the Chinese Republic. Um, we've now got a new Prime Minister. We change Prime Ministers quite often. So um, we, we lost Malcolm Turnbull, but now we've got um, Scott Morrison. And um, another person I quite admire, Jacinda Ahern, who's the Prime Minister of New Zealand. Now, they've all came out and said that we need to be investing money in, in science and technology. And I'll just go back, try and get back onto here. And what I, I like about the fact is you know, they're, they're saying that we need to invest this money in STEM and they're actually putting the money up into, into the STEM education. But their reason isn't so much, I think, because um, because the idea that we, we want our students to be um, to have jobs. The fact is, you know, if we don't have the technology, um, then we're not going to have an income for our countries. And mm -hmm. when you look at India and China, I mean, they're producing large amounts of engineers, um, whereas Australia and New Zealand. Um, quite a, a very small population in comparison, but we still need to be out there and and, and basically winning that battle. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm just going to go back to our screen and I'm going to jump through a few slides. If you, I apologise for that. That's okay. I do want to make sure we have some um, time for um, a discussion on female engagement or... Yes, yes. Let me just jump through. Here, I'm, I've, I'm okay. going a bit over if you are, if you have some good stuff that you don't want to leave out. Yep, that's that's okay. We'll, we'll keep going. Um, I like this photo. Um, this is a, is a photo from 1927, and um, straight away people will actually recognise Albert Einstein in the front row. Um, it's an amazing photo because out of the 29 people there, 17 um, actually received Nobel Prizes. And um, But what is to, to note is if you count how many females there are, because... See one. Yep, there's only one, and that's um, Marie Curie. And um, when you consider back then... Um, how much intelligence we actually lost that we weren't using um, because there should have been, uh, half of those should have been female. And, um, and I think what's happening now is we're starting to actually look at the fact that um, we're spending money on, on educating um, every student, but if we don't allow or give opportunities for our girls to be involved in science, then they're going to miss out on those careers. And the other thing is we're going to miss out as a nation on, on their intelligence in those careers. And um, it's amazing. Um, Marie Curie actually was received two Nobel Prizes, so um, I thought it was quite amazing. Okay. Um, and when you consider what's happening at the moment, this is um, the Australian High Commissioner for um, Australia over in New Zealand, uh, myself, and um, Andy Kilsby, who um, runs 
the rocket lab over in New Zealand. And when you consider New Zealand's actually quite small in a population, their plan is to fire off a satellite every two weeks and, um, and just use the technology because the technology is getting less and less, um, less costly. And, um, but I, I said about education being the key. Um, I'm going to give some homework, and this is um, a great teacher of mine, Bill Fraser. Bill, unfortunately, passed away a few years ago, but um, a great mentor for me. He was actually a music teacher, and um, but just a, a great teacher and um, was always there for his students. Um, another teacher I should recognise too is um, Robert McDonald, who I had as a sixth class teacher who was just um, absolutely uh, awesome people. But um, look, getting back to to teaching, I mean, we all recognise this face of uh, Albert Einstein, but people forget that Albert Einstein, at one stage in his life, he was actually young. He was a student, and um, he actually recognised how great his his maths teacher he had, and. Um, and I think we've just got to remember that in our classrooms and in our schools, we've got students that will be just as smart as Albert Einstein. Okay, um, I'm just going to jump back because I'm wary of time. Don't worry about it. That's right. Now, do you have any questions so far on no, I do have a question for you. So what are you um, what do you perceive as some of the bigger challenges in math, um, science, engineering, technology education today? Like how are students taking it in and stuff like that? Yeah, look, the the big thing is the um, it's like with any idea, the hardest thing is is not accepting the new idea, but it's getting rid of the old idea. And um, and I still have conversations with people that will tell me that the girls are no good at mathematics or that you know, um, that girls sh shouldn't do physics because it's a boy subject. Mm -hmm. And we do say it in our, in our classes um, that our, our physics classes will be predominantly um, boys. Um, but if I look over and I think about who the best students have ever been, my best ever physics class, um, my best ever um, student in that class was a girl, um, Bernanda Telelovic, and um, just amazing that you know, girls are you know, just as good as, as boys. There, there shouldn't be, and there is no reason. I mean, there's no difference in their brain. There's, there's, there's no study that actually shows that you know, boys are better than girls. It's, it's just that's the perceived idea and, and probably a, something which has been promoted by by men rather than by females. Mm -hmm. um, probably. Um, another question I have is, what is your favourite tech to use in the classroom? You use a bunch of different things, it seems. What's your favourite or go-to program device? Oh, um, look, there's, there's a few things I'd, I'd like to use. Um, very much um, photos and video. Um, I'd, I love the idea of um, technology and, and phones in, in Australia at the moment. We've just, um, I, I think we're about to, or if not, we haven't, um, banned phones for students in primary school. And however, in high school, I see there's a great use for using that, that technology because the, the phones are, are basically, they're, they're computers and, um, and they're a great way of storing ideas. The, uh, if I just fly through, I'll, I'll give you a short, let me just jump through. I'm finding this so incredibly interesting. I also have cows moo softly. In no, it's going to be imprinted in your brain. Here, um, look, um, oh. 
if if I talk about oh pardon me, I'll just take a sip of water there. Um, this is a Commodore 64. And if I talk about Commodore 64, normally the students they think I'm talking about a car, but <laughs> that was my first computer. Uh, it had 64K of memory. Um, prior to that, as far as computing, I'd actually used um, these punch cards for putting it in data. And, and you've got to think how technology has changed you know, from, from um, having a, a floppy disk that would hold 700K of memory to something now that will actually hold gigabytes. Now, if I look at, um, this is Austin. Um, Austin doesn't know how to play the ukulele yet, but he's, he's trying. Um, but he's, he's only, he's not two years old yet, but he knows how to actually swipe um, applications on, on an iPhone. And I, I start to, I think about, well, my old technology was the Commodore 64. Well, by the time he's 15, what is the technology that's going to be available to him? And um, so, you know, with, with students, these were um, some students. We, um, we did a project on um, collecting the, the blood pressure and pulse rates of, and oxygen rates of, um, of people. And I did some work with NASA over in India. But um, when we look at the technology, that oximeter that you can see in the bottom red there. Um, I remember when they used to be hundreds of dollars. And then I bought some, which were only for $40 each on eBay. And I thought that was a bonus. But you can actually just download an app on your iPhone that will allow you to do exactly the same at no cost. Wow. The, um, Are they as accurate, do you think? Yes. Yep. Definitely just as as accurate. Now the, I'll, I'll leave, I'll just, um, before I, I do leave, because we're um, almost running out of time there, the, one of the things I was fortunate to do um, last year, and, and for the year before I, I was able to go to, to India, and I was, I was absolutely amazed at just the lack of resources that they had in a lot of their schools, um, especially in, in remote areas. Um, then I was lucky um, last year to actually go to um, to a refugee camp over in Kenya, and it was amazing to see over there that um, they would have a school that had maybe have two and a half thousand students, but but nobody trained as teachers. So. Um, I, I look at the, you know, quite often we complain about the, the lack of technology or the fact that, you know, the interactive whiteboard's not working. But um, if we realise how lucky we are um, and how lucky our students are, it's, it's quite, a, quite a story. Um, I'll show two video clips. The one, if you remember the, the, the students are on the bikes, um, this was their, their winning video. And... Um, the, the good thing I, I thought about it was the learning that went that that took place for them to actually make the video because they thought that they their learning was to learn how to make a video but it was the learning which was actually all the content that went into it and the teamwork so um, I'll just put that on Yeah, I know that. Our efforts to land astronauts on the moon in the late 1960s was a Sputnik moment, a moment where a nation had come together to accomplish what was unreachable. This also will be the Bloodstock moment, but one that unites nations and the world together. It started 40 years ago. Scientific data showed that the Earth was warming. There was a plethora of data to show it. Peace. Our governments did not have a fortitude to act. Our destruction of burning of fossil fuels for power had devastating effects. When it became popular to give attention to global warming, it was already too late. The Earth started heating up quicker than we predicted. 
Countries move towards alternative resources. Solar, wind, even geothermal and tidal, but still it was too late. In 2014, NASA created the Helio Project to transfer energy from the and convert it to electricity to power. The NASA multi-scale mission will investigate how magnetic fields around Earth connect and disconnect. The project has the ability to tap into unleashed amounts of energy. If successful, will capture the static electricity produced at the reconnection point of the magnetosphere supercapacitors. And then safely beam the energy as microwaves back to the collection points. Okay. It may be too late, but the energy from the magnetosphere might save us. I I quite liked it. I always chuckle for that. The, um, the student had trying to, to say the word plethora and it was amazing but now all of that was done just using very simple technology that you know just with phones and um, and with a blue screen so the, you know the technology is there now a few projects that I'm working on at the moment uh, one is to um, to try and get more communication and cut or cooperation with with teaching over in in Africa and India so um, I, I might make some of my email available if anyone's interested in in doing that um, even if you know, actually I'll find a I'll put up a slide there with some details that would be great Okay, um, one project is the very big sundial project. So the idea is to make these large sundials. Um, and the idea is that they can be made anywhere in the world. And if people go to the iSTEM website, um, there's actually details there. Um, the, the other thing too is, um, there's a picture of a cow, but um, if I just jump through. It knows Moose, yeah, cows are always, it's amazing. They've got cows everywhere. Um, but at the moment, uh, there's a lot of controversy over measles and um, and vaccinations. And that all came up because um, one guy, this um, that awful guy. Person, yeah, uh, awful person, Andrew Wakefield. Um, but, you know, he wrote a, a scientific paper that basically said that there was a link between the um, vaccinations and um, oh. Oh, I forget what the wasn't it autism? Yes, that was it. Well done. Um, I, I'll give you a big tick for that. Um, I mean, that was it was definitely false, but you know, it's still there that people believe that you know maybe there is a bit of, of truth in it. And we've been, uh, well, I say we, but Rotary has been pushing to try and get rid of polio and through vaccinations. And when you can see how... What is how, I'm not familiar with that. Um, with polio? Um, I don't know, with, with Rotary, Rotary and yeah. you Rotary is a, um, uh, a, a service club, I suppose you'd call it, just um, of, of people around the world that, that put money into projects. So okay. they're... One of the projects they're working on is, is trying to get rid of, of polio. And polio is a is an awful disease because um, it affects your, your muscles and um, in the end you, you actually need to have um, a machine that will actually breathe for you. Now, um, in the past we've had hospitals that have been full of these machines because um, we had polio um, all around the world um, that was you know, 1988, uh, 2014, it's been reduced very, very, uh, right down to a small level. So um, that's one of the projects that I'm trying to, to push that we, we get students involved in um, trying to improve our vaccination rates because we can get rid of, we've got rid of smallpox, we can get rid of polio and we can probably get rid of of measles and these other diseases that students well, that we don't need to have, mm. and the 
the um, the wave of people who are less interested in vaccination or are anti-vaccination is on the rise, which is a scary. Yes, thing. it's um, not. it's it's amazing that it gets up to be um, top news. I mean, when when I was young, it was. Um, it was expected that you would get measles. And um, if you were a girl and you didn't have measles, then um, if your parents found out about someone in the neighbourhood that did have measles, then you'd be taken around so that you would actually get it. And um, that's because if, you're, if you end up catching measles whilst you're, you're pregnant, then it's, it's really awful for the, the unborn child. Mm. So it, it was looked upon that there was a risk and it was just accepted. But you know, thousands of, of kids used to die from it. And um, and if they didn't die, they would end up getting you know, mental illnesses as well. So it was um, it's good that we're actually able to get rid of it. But um, yes. every, once a, every once in a while in, in Australia, it will be big news because there will be someone that will come from overseas and and will hear that they've been to this place and this place and, and suffering from measles. So um, so that's a big push. The, um, the, um, what I'd, I might do is, is leave the presentation at that point. Um, and if, if people want to, to get in contact with me, they, they can do that you know, through PISA for you or um, um, I'll leave my email address and, and that can be, be done. But there's, there's so many things that we can do using technology that, that kids already you know, are able to use. So it's um, why we don't use it, um, I, I do not know. The, um, quite often some people say that you, know, you can Google anything to find an answer, but um, you need to have that, that basic knowledge, first of all, to actually know what you're looking at. Um, otherwise, my, my first example about dihydrogen monoxide um, it, it just doesn't work for people. So you know, if you've got access to Google all the time and you use it all the time, then, yep, okay, it's going to work. But um, I think we're just going to make sure that we, we look at what's fair for, for our kids and mm -hmm. I suppose treat our kids or our, our students as if, um, as if they're our future. And, um, yeah. Yeah, and they are. Yeah. Um, Ken, thank you so much. That was amazing. Um, do you have any last words before we wrap up or? No, that's, that's, okay. that's all. Um, just thank you for the experience. And I hope our Gary and Baps and Fords using that screen share doesn't look too awkward. And, mm -hmm. uh, but it's always good to use that technology. And you know, to, to think about this technology, you know, just as, a, as an extra story, when I was very young, my next door neighbour invited all the local neighbourhood across to his house um, for four o'clock in the morning to hear him talk to his daughter who was over in the UK on a holiday. And, and I think when you consider how much that technology has changed, that we're able to do this, you know, I can talk to, to you over in Berlin and as if you're just next door. It's it's incredible. It really, truly is incredible. And to everyone who is watching, the format that Ken and I are using right now is actually completely free. It's called Google Hangouts. Um, it's tied in with YouTube. It's quite simple to use. There's a lot of information on Google, on Google if you research it, a lot of blogs that give you step-by-step -step, um, ways to use it. And you can connect with anyone across the world for free, um, as long as you have a, a Google account, which is yeah. awesome. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, if you don't have a Google account, um, you should get one and um, before somebody gets one in your name. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Ken, thank you so, so much. And hopefully we get to have you on another Pizza for You webinar in the future. Okay. Well, thanks, Jennifer. Okay. Bye. Bye, everyone.